Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers to give me the opportunity to present my work over here. So I will be, uh, today I will be talking about this, uh, this new algorithm which we developed in our lab called Demand, which is designed to actually infer the mechanism of action of a drug. So before I start, let me define what is the, really the mechanism of action of a drug. So mechanism of actions are actually any uh, context-specific biochemical interactors or effectors through which a compound produces its final uh, pharmacological effect. And means just to be uh, sure that it's not really, when I talk about the uh, mechanism of action, I'm not really talking about the direct targets of the drug. So there is a bit difference between MOA of a drug and the direct target. So um, MOA is like identification of, uh, MOA is really, really criti crit critical in the development of drug development. And the uh, knowledge of MOA is really relevant to determine this on target specificity to also to understand the efficacy of the drug also to identify the off target effects related associated with the drug related toxicity and also with the uh, uh, also with the knowledge of this uh, moa we can actually uh, use this the uh, existing drugs in the in the market for the drug, drug repurposing or drug repositioning so there are uh, currently there are a lot of approaches which people are using to identify mechanism of action of the drug. So I'm just listing some of them over here, which broadly classifies into either the experimental approaches, which relies on the direct binding assays or the chemoinformatic approaches or expression-based computational methods, network-based approaches. However, all these methods actually they have some or the other disadvantages. For example, like experimental approaches, they work well, but they can identify only the proteins with a very strong binding affinity. Whereas the chemoinformatic approaches, they work, but uh, they, re uh, they require a very detailed 3D structures of both the drugs as well as the, uh, the candidate targets. And expression-based computational methods, they, since they rely on the similarity between profiles, they are not really good predictors of the mechanism of action of the drugs. And network-based approaches means, uh, means and that's the one actually I'm going to talk about, but the current network-based approaches, either they require uh, the knowledge of the sub-network uh, in which the uh, mechanism of action of the drug could be involved or requires a lot, uh, large amount of the gene expression profiles uh, data. So uh, in light of these things, we developed a new algorithm in the lab called DEMAND, which, is, which stands for the uh, drug mode of actions using the network dysregulation. So this uh, method actually, it, takes the context-specific regulatory networks and takes the gene expression profiles generated following the drug perturbations and interrogate the network to identify the uh, drug mechanism of action. So our hypothesis is that if a gene is, is, a mechanism of, is involved in the mechanism of action of the drug, what we will have is it, all the interactions which are this gene is involved in, they are going to be dysregulated. So briefly about the algorithm is it needs for, two different inputs. One is the context-specific gene regulatory network, and then the second is the gene expression profile generated after the drug perturbation, and also it needs the control samples to compare that whether the, the, uh, the interactions in the network, they are getting dysregulated following the drug perturbation or not. So this, uh, to infer the gene, uh, gene regulatory network, I mean, since uh, we have our own set of the algorithms in our lab, which is like Arachne, uh, Mindy, and uh, Bay algorithm, so we use that algorithm, but you can use any, any, any algorithm to infer the gene regulatory network, as long as the network which you're inferring is a context-specific network. I will not go into the detail of that. If the network is not context-specific, how does it affect the result? So my colleague Isha is presenting a result on that one. So. Next, so once we have this, all these inputs, so what this algorithm does is, it for every pair of genes which are involved in an interaction, it computes, uh, it computes this kind of probability density uh, for the expression for the using the control samples as well as the samples which are uh, the gene expression profiles generated following the drug perturbation. So I'm just giving you like four different examples over here just to show that what we mean by really the, uh, the dysregulation of the interactions, which we actually measure using the KL divergence using the probability density. So in first case, like when we take about gene one, gene two, we see that this cloud, which we call is the probability density, after before the control and the drug treatment, there is no, I don't know why it's changing. It's not really much different. However, like in the other cases, uh, uh, in the second case, it, it looks like there was a negative correlation between gene one and gene three, but after the drug perturbation, it became sort of positive correlation. And in the other two cases where there was no correlation to positive correlation or some correlation to loss of correlation. So this is like sort of the kind of uh, interactions, uh, the dysregulations I'm talking about. So we measure this dysregulation for every interaction in the network using the KL divergence. Once we infer the, uh, once we identify all this, uh, the, 
interactions which are dysregulated, we actually comp uh, assign the final p-value for to each gene depending on if they are really enriched with the dysregulated interactions or not. So to uh, 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 assign the significance for the, uh, uh, the enrichment for the dysregulation, we actually just uh, integrate all their p-values using, uh, using the Fisher's method. However, when we use the Fisher's method, we have to be careful because Fisher's method assumed that there are the, all these evidences or the p uh, interactions, they are independent. But in reality, they are not because they are connected to a central hub over here. So we correct it using, the, this is called Brown's method, which actually corrects for the dependence between the interactions. So I will not go into the detail of Brown's method. So once we have this uh, 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 integration, we actually rank all the genes for based on the, low, uh, the lowest p-value to high, highest p-values, indicating the, the genes uh, being most probably uh, involved in the mechanism of action of a drug. So to, once we have this method, we applied this method on this data set, which was actually also used in the, uh, one of these dream challenges two years ago. So this data set is generated in uh, DLB, uh, DLBCL B cell lymphoma cell lines, uh, where the, drug, uh, the cell lines were treated with 14 different drugs profiled at three different time points, and the drug, drug treatment was done using two different concentrations. So in the end, for every drug, we have the 18 different uh, gene expression profiles, and we have the corresponding control, DMSO samples. So we uh, applied this uh, demand method on, uh, on all these 14 uh, samples. So like to validate first for, uh, to validate the first thing is what we did is instead of checking for the drug mechanism of action we checked it how well we can actually identify the primary targets for all these drugs so out of these 14 drugs from the literature we could identify the uh, the primary targets for 11 of the drugs so i'm showing you uh, on the left hand side just the uh, if you look the top 100 genes which are predicted for uh, predicted by the demand for all these drugs how uh, what a fraction of of the direct targets we can predict. So we can act. So for all these drugs, for of these 11 drugs, uh, in the top 100, we could actually identify the primary target. So 15% for 15 of the primary targets. But again, I, I want to say that this method is not really designed to identify primary targets. We are just checking its efficacy right now to see that if we can identify the primary targets or not. It's designed mainly to identify the mechanism of action. So, and then uh, we are comparing it with the t-test over here just to see that because people usually say that if the genes are the genes which are most differentially expressed, they are also involved in the mechanism of action of the drug. So when we compare our method with the t-test, we see that our method actually performs five times uh, more than the, the performance of the t-test, where the t-test actually achieves only 3% accuracy, where the, uh, the sensitivity, where demand achieves 15% of the, uh, the sensitivity in the top 100 genes. When we look uh, now this, uh, so this one is an overall for all the drugs. Now, when we break down for all these drugs, now what we are showing over here is the rank of the primary targets which we are actually predicting. So like for this is for cyclohexamide, when we look the first gene which is predicted by the demand, actually that was the gene which was involved, the primary target of the cyclohexamide and so on. So when we look more carefully about all these uh, genes, what we found is that for seven out of 11 uh, uh, drugs, we could actually find the primary targets in the top 100. However, for the last four drugs, we couldn't find it because if we see the rank which we predict is around 10,000 or 2,000, 3,000. So it didn't, it seems that this uh, demand algorithm did not really work for the last four drugs. But over here, we are actually, again, uh, this statement is based on looking the, only the primary targets, not the genes involved in the MOA of the drug. So when we look more carefully about all these drugs, uh, what we found is that there were the two of these drugs which we couldn't find the, the direct targets, they were campothecin and doxorubicin. Both of them are uh, uh, topoisomerase inhibitor. And in our, in our data set, there was another drug, ethoposide, which was also topoisomerase inhibitor. For ethoposide, the algorithm could identify topoisomerase, but for campothecin, doxorubicin, it, it could not. However, when we look more carefully, what we found is the top genes which were identified for all these three drugs, uh, ethoposide, campothecin, doxorubicin, were uh, all these genes which were the direct effectors of the topoisomerase activity. And all these genes are the genes involved in the DNA damage response, which is GAT45, PCNA, CDKN1, and Aurora kinase, PLK1. When we look also more carefully for the doxorubicin, doxorubicin actually is known to cause DNA damage through the, uh, through the histone eviction, which is actually mediated by the CAT5. And when we look for the predictions for do uh, doxorubicin, we find the CAT5 gene only in the doxorubicin. We didn't find it for any other drug. Secondly, uh, uh, also we found additional gene for uh, doxorubicin, which is a sick one. So doxorubicin is known to cause cardiomyopathy, and the gene which is actually involved in the cardiomyopathy is the sick one. And so this actually suggests that this method can actually also identify the genes involved in the drug toxicity. And this gene was uh, only identified for doxorubicin and uh, not for any other drugs. 
when we look again like more carefully for uh, in our data set there were only five drugs which were actually involved in the which has are involved in the dna damage so these are all these drugs which are in the dna uh, in the DNA damage, and the, when we look at the genes which are involved in the DNA damage response, we find this uh, on these genes uh, to be predicted only for the drugs which are in, which are uh, involved in the DNA damage, and not for the, any other drugs uh, uh, in the uh, with other different mechanisms which are not nothing to do with the DNA damage. So next, what we did is we went on for some of these validations. So we selected two of these drugs, vincristine and mitomycin C. So vincristine actually uh, causes the disruption in the formation of the mitotic spindle, and the, uh, the one of the direct targets for vincristine is TUB. And we found actually TUB gene, we found it in the top five uh, genes predicted for the vincristine. Then we looked more carefully for the other four genes which we predict, which are over here, CCNB1, VHL, and nf kappa beta one and RSP3A. So we did a, like an assay to see that whether any of these genes actually affects the activity of vincristine. So what we did is we silenced all these genes and we measured the, the response after for, uh, doing the treatment with them with vincristine. And we, what we found is after the silencing of VHL, means the cells become much more sensitive to vincristine treatment. And after uh, silencing for the other two genes, RSP3 and CCMB1, they make it the cells much more resistant to the vincristine treatment and the only ones which did not show any response was nf nf kappa, uh, nf kappa beta 1a and the similarly for mitomycin c means we found this jack2 gene and when we silence the the not silence actually when we inhibit the jack2 using the jack2 specific inhibitor we again found that uh, uh, mitomycin C actually becomes resistant, uh, so the cells becomes again resistant to the mitomycin C treatment and this uh, resistance was actually a completely dose dependent. So de like if you inhibit more and more JAK2 using the JAK2 inhibitor, the cells were more resistant to the mitomycin C. So these were like some of these novel uh, 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 MOA which we actually predicted for these drugs and we actually could validate it. Next, once we were sure actually that we, uh, our method works in predicting the mechanism of action of the drugs, then we asked that can we use this, uh, the similarity between the mechanism of action to predict, to identify the drug pairs with similar pharmacological effect. So to, to do this thing, what we did is we take this drug one, we uh, run demand and identify the mechanism of action of the drugs, and we take the second drug over here and we again identify the mechanism of action and then what we do is we just do a simply an overlap between the mechanism of action using the Fisher exact test. So if there is an overlap, we call it that these two drugs might have a similar pharmacological effect and we applied it on this entire data set and what we found is the top drug pairs with a similar mechanism of actions were all the drugs with a, uh, 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 the, all, the, all those drug pairs were the topoisomeric inhibitors and are involved in the, I mean, the drug damage. But this data set was actually too small to actually assess the significance of all these drugs. So what we did is we generated additional data set in our lab, which is this, this is the data set in B-cell lymphoma cell line. So we selected three different cell line, LY3, LY7, and U2931 cell line, treated the, all these cell lines with 92 different uh, FDA approved compounds and did a profiling after two, uh, three different time points, six, 12, and 24 hours. So now we have like this big data set which we generated, which could give us a possible combinations of 4,000 drug pairs. So we applied this uh, method and we ranked all these 4,000 drug pairs from the ones which are, we predict to have a similar pharmacological effect based on the predicted mechanism of action. So to actually valid, to, uh, uh, to check whether uh, we could actually uh, um, rank or predict the drugs with a pharmacological effect, we use three different evidences from the literature. So one is that we call that our uh, tr uh, prediction is true, that if the two drugs share the same targets, or if they have the same therapeutic indications as uh, reported in the ATC database, or if they also have the uh, similar sensitivity profile as uh, reported in the, the paper from, uh, from Broad last year. So the way what they compute the sensitivity profile is, in, in the in the Stroud Schreiber's lab, what they did is they took 354 small molecules and they computed the sensitivity as defined by the area under the drug response curve across a panel of 242 different cell lines. So for all these drugs, we compute what we do is we compute a Pearson correlation that if the two drugs have a similar sensitivity profile across a panel of 250 cell lines, we call them that they are also similar. They have a similar pharmacological effect. So we use all these evidences to validate our predictions. So what I'm showing you is just again, again the top 100 pairs which we predict and like if we integrate or look all these evidences, around 50 to 60% of the drug, top drug pairs which we predict could actually validate it using all these uh, evidences. However, there are still like in the top 100, there were still 40% of the drug pairs which you couldn't uh, validate it. So what we did is we selected actually one of these drug, drug pairs which is the drug pair of sulfasalazine and altratamine. And this one was the first drug pair which 
in our in the ranking with no evidences from the literature of being they being similar so what is in the about these two um, about these two drugs uh, altrathamine is an anti neoplastic drug means and it's used uh, means uh, uh, for the treatment of the cancer but it's no one knows that the mechanism of action of altrathamine however for the sulfasalazine last year uh, brent stockwell's lab published this entire pathway like entire mechanism of action for sulfasalazine so briefly sulfasalazine inhibits the cysteine axis which actually inhibits the uh, the uh, the transport of cysteine to the uh, cytoplasm where cysteine is actually involved in the biosynthesis of glucathione gsh and so inhibition of uh, uh, sulfasalazine actually reduces the level of gsh and in turns all the downstream effectors of the gsh which is gpx uh, gpx4 and lipid ross level so we um, hypothesized that since we are predicting both these drugs to have a similar pharmacological effect so does is it possible that the altrathamine also have the similar mechanism of action as what we have is for the sulfasalazine so what we did is we did some assay with the help of a uh, uh, brent stockwell slab so first thing is what we did is we, we, we uh, to check the uh, for the the level of gsh after doing the treatment with the sulfasalazine so when we do a treatment with the sulfasalazine we don't see a decrease in the levels of the gsh whereas uh, the sulfasalazine means as it's already reported in the paper it, it depletes the uh, gsh level so it shows that actually it uh, looks like altrathamine doesn't really starts from the gsh but maybe it could work downstream so to check more downstream effects of altrathamine we check the activity on uh, GP, gpx4 so what we did is we to check the activity of uh, uh alt if altramine inhibit uh, altramine inhibits gpx4 or not we looked one of these direct substrates of gpx4 which is pcoh and what we do is if after the treatment of the gpx with uh, uh, after treatment with altramine we found that it actually uh, it we directly affects the level of the gp uh, uh, pcoh and the finally what we did is we also check whether the altramine um, treatment also induces the lipid ross level or not and like the sulfur what happened okay so like the sulfasalazine we found that altrathamine actually also increases the level of the uh, um, uh, lipid ross so in the end what we could actually using our the similarity between the the two drugs we could actually establish the mechanism of action of the altrathamine that what we say is that altrathamine actually inhibits gpx4 and then in turns uh, affects the level of GP, uh, lipid ross and then finally the the growth inhibition so it also suggests that maybe the uh, the antineoplastic activity of the altrathamine could be actually uh, affected by the reduction or the or its activity on the gpx4 level so in the end what we did uh, like to, just to summarize we actually we uh, we developed this new algorithm which can uh, reliably identifies the mechanism of action of the compound using gene expression data and using a context specific network and it predicts the compound pairs also with the similar pharmacological effects and me uh, this mechanism of action predicted by demands actually provide uh, immediate testable biological hypothesis and this method means i didn't show it these methods can work with a very small number of gene expression profiles like if you have only six replicates you can apply demand so means now this this method can be readily applied to a lot of different gene expression profiles available in the various databases such as cmap and links so in the acknowledgement so first of all i want to thank andrea so because he is the pi i mean not because he is pi also he has helped in the project so <laughs> uh, and uh, so the the most thank i want to say is the jung who actually he is the one who developed most of this thanks together with the ashi and then for the experimental validation is done by prem brent stockwell and von yang and i want to thank also archana paula maria and gonzalo to provide feedbacks during the, both for the exp, uh, biological uh, hypothesis building the biological hypothesis and during the development of the method